Hey there, and welcome to Into the Terminal, episode 59. Today we're going to be talking about scaling your operations from either a single node to tens or hundreds or even thousands of nodes. And I can think of no one better to discuss that with than my favorite co-host, Mr. Scott Bryan. Buddy. So why don't we jump on in? Um, and one of the things that we're going to look at in the critical path here today is using a built into Red Hat Enterprise Linux technology called system roles to apply a task across our fleet of systems. Now, in this case, our fleet of systems is three boxes. Um, but one of the great things about this technology is it can very easily scale up to tens, hundreds, or thousands of boxes um, to propagate your changes. All right, so what we're looking at here is a, a RHEL 9 system. And I'm just going to do a DNF install. Uh, rel system roles. All right, so rel system roles are uh, based on Ansible technology, uh, a specific thing called an Ansible role, and we author them to allow you to do a variety of different tasks on the system that are kind of common system administration tasks. So what I've done is I've created a uh, a playbook. Uh, and looking at this playbook, actually, let me uh, tmux real quick. There we go. Uh, so, okay. so what I've done is I've created this playbook, uh, and in the playbook, I in uh, I, I define what systems I want this playbook to be executed across. So in this case, I want it to happen on the local system and client systems. And I'll show you in a second. Actually, I can show you down here in the bottom terminal. Uh, here in the host CNI file, this is where we define what those client systems are. So when the Ansible playbook is executed, it's going to execute the contents on localhost plus the systems listed in the clients part of the host CNI, which is these two systems. And you can see that I've actually got uh, uh, shells to those two systems here that I can switch to. All right, so um, now that we've got where we should apply this, and imagine if you will, that instead of just two clients, we have like a thousand, that would also work just fine. Uh, so now we wanna define what it is we want this playbook to do. And down at the bottom, in the roles section, I include a role called rel system roles time sync, which will allow you to set the time servers and parameters for NTP configuration on your target systems. So now that I've included the role, I have to tell it what to do for the configuration of these uh, systems out there. And so for most systems, uh, by default, they're going to use something like the pooled NTP servers from uh, pool.ntp.org. And for my machine, I want very specifically to choose this one stratum one host for time server. And then I'll grab a couple of random ones out of the pool as well. All right, so before we execute this playbook and actually make these changes across the system, maybe be interested in to see what our current configuration is. So if we do a crony crony see sources so this is what uh what we're currently set to right we're using a uh, looks like a gcp based stratum 2 mail uh ntp server only one and uh for ntp servers you probably want to have three ish um and that's because when you get time back from an ntp server um you do a whole bunch of machinations on it. The service that's actually setting the NTP configuration does a whole bunch of machinations on it to try and determine how quality or how real that time data was that you just got back. So if we only ever pull one thing, then we don't have any comparisons to apply it against. Uh, so who knows whether that's actually right or not right. So I like using at least three because then I have a couple of different samples and I can combine them together to figure out if one of them is way off base, right? And then I can discount it, or at least the um, the services that provide time would automatically discount it. All right, so um, 
we're going to run this playbook and it's going to set my time servers explicitly to uh, timedb.nist.gov and pull a random one out of the pool and pull a second random one out of the pool. So I'll end up with three time servers to find on my system. All right. So let's go ahead and apply that. All right, and while it's running, uh, some other interesting things about system roles. Uh, so system roles are designed at Red Hat to work across different versions of RHEL. So for example, in RHEL 6, we shipped NTPD. And in RHEL 7, we shipped NTPD and Crony, but NTPD was the default unless you changed it. In RHEL 8, we shipped both NTPD and Crony, but Crony was the default unless you changed it. And in RHEL 9, we only shipped Crony. Well, notice there's nothing in my configuration of the system role to talk about NTPD or crony, and that's because the system role itself will look at the system's configuration and decide what is the appropriate mechanism to use. Uh, so at the end of the day, my time servers are applied to the systems that I specified, and whether they are rel 6, 7, 8, or 9, and whether they were using NTPD or crony, the right choices were made to make sure that these time servers that I specified are the ones that are used. All right, so now that we've finished our run of the playbook, um, I can look at my crony C sources, and I can see that now my system is configured to look at uh, time.nist.gov. Oh, it picked up another stratum one time server, uh, ntp.time.in.ua, and then it picked up a stratum two time server as well. And we could um, go over to our other systems, So here on client one, uh, it's using timedb.nist.gov like I wanted, and it picked up a couple of random NTP um, servers out of the pool. And if I look at client two, uh, it also did the same thing, right? It explicitly defined the nist.gov server and then picked up a couple of random ones out of the NTP pool. So this is a way that we can operate across a whole batch of systems that we define in our host INI configuration file uh, and apply a configuration change to them. And notice that I didn't really have to do a whole lot of work to make that happen. And I can just keep adding hosts in that list if I wanna keep adding more and more machines that I wanna apply this configuration to. All right, there's a whole bunch of other uh, system rules that come with RHEL. There's ones to apply kernel tunable settings. There's ones to apply um, firewall rules. There's ones to apply, um, geez, there's, there's like, what, 15, 20 now? 15 there's around, a, around oh, that number. Yeah, postfix mail server configuration. Like there's, a, there's just a pile of them. Uh, SSH client and server configuration. So... I chose time because it's relatively simple and relatively easy to kind of explain and understand what the options are. Um, but there's a lot more that you can apply across your population as well. All right, why don't you stay with us after the transition and we'll talk more about like some considerations to think about when scaling up from the single system administration that we usually talk about into something much larger. All right, so this is episode 59 of End of the Terminal, and we called it uh, playfully Enterprise Up, because as, uh, as we've mentioned, we, we look at one-to-one uh, -one server configurations during uh, most of our episodes. But today we wanted to zoom out, and uh, I don't know about you, Scott, but I wouldn't want to have to, uh, to go and configure uh, ChronyD across 1,000 servers or 10,000 servers. Um, I'd much rather set it once and deploy it across multiple different platforms, but also to be able to ensure that my configuration on one server is consistent across the rest of my enterprise. Yeah, and on one of the uh, original episodes of um, Rel Presents, I had somebody from the Enable Sysadmin community come on, and we, we got into a little bit of a, a heated debate on like system administration and the state of it. And... Um, but out of that, I wrote a, an article for Enable Sysadmin that said something like, the golden age of system administration is dead. Because <laughs> it used to be that, um, you know, we, we had 
relatively small server populations because servers were super expensive. Um, and we hired people to manage like five servers, right? So it was okay to have these processes where you had to lovingly curate your, your machine and take a lot of expertise and time to lovingly curate that machine. Um, but now we are well beyond that, right? We have things like cloud where we're dealing with instances we could turn on or off uh, with very little effort. And yet they have to apply some uh, configuration. They have to use some service and they have to be repeatable. So when we turn the next one on, it's almost identical, right? Or the next one after that, or the next one after that. And so this changes kind of our approach to systems administration from, hey, let me DNF install this thing on this box to how do I make sure that my golden image that I use for these 8,000 boxes I could potentially spin up all look the same? And we've got two different approaches we can follow. The first would be kind of an ad hoc DIY do-it-yourself approach, uh, which we'll talk about first, because uh, we've we've actually covered the the topic in in generalities on the show a few times. But then, if you're part of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux ecosystem, there's also some tools available, some things that are even built into your subscription uh, or built into the operating system itself that we'll talk about how how to use those. Uh, so why don't we start with kind of the DIY approach? <coughs> So back, uh, way back when now, in episode 17, we introduced the concept of shell scripting using bash scripts, basically a chain of commands um, mixed in with pipes and things like regexes uh, to basically string together a series of commands. And that's, that's most people's foray into, uh, into uh, automation. Uh, I, I, I use that term loosely in this situation. Um, and uh, also in episode 20 as well, we got into a little bit deeper, a little bit more complex uh, bash scripting as well. Yeah, and like, you know, we just talked about Ansible, right? And I showed you using the time system rule. And I said, there's a whole bunch of logic in it, right? That if it's rel six and using this, I should do this task. If it's rel seven and using crony, I should do this. But if it's using NTPD, I should do something different. And so in that Ansible system rule, we've built in all this logic on how to change the tasks that are performed or the files that are edited based off of the version. Well, if you're doing a DIY solution um, and writing shell scripts, guess what? You get to do all of that explore, ex exploration and customization. So you like write shell scripts to say, if the Red Hat release version is this, then do these things. But if it's something else, do this other stuff. Um, and so if and else's case statements, like these are your friends for doing this, uh, this DIY approach to automating across a whole population of systems. Um, well, I mean, yeah, you're looking at like, one to three lines of YAML for a system role to define that versus, I mean, just guessing you're looking at what, 20, 20 lines of code for an if then else statement. At least. Um, so very quickly, what you'll realize is that you're spending a lot of time building your thing and putting in all of these catches for, well, if this is the case, here's what I have to do. Oh, but on this one system over in this environment, that's not the case. So I have to build in a little bit of logic to handle that special outlier. And as you go across your population, you'll find out that there's more and more and more outliers that you did not know about. Um, and you end up spending like more and more and more time developing this really comprehensive tool. But here's the other thing you're not considering. Like, yes, you can make the tool. You can find all the things and you can update it. Okay. Now fast forward a year to future you. <laughs> and there's been an update and you now have an additional class of boxes out in your population. Well, guess what? Future you gets to spend a whole bunch of time updating that really complex thing that you made to account for this new complexity that you didn't have a year ago with past you. Or my favorite is when current you joins a new company as a contractor and the original sysadmin who built the enterprise that you're now responsible for uh, has left and then his replacement left and then his replacement left. Uh, and now you've got this thousand line um, either bash or I came across a company that did a lot of automation using Perl um, 
to then try and decipher what all these different if then else statements are and trying to understand that um, all of this all this code just actually did one thing and you could replace all of it with just going in and running one command across your fleet. <laughs> I'm, I'm after the episode. I'm just going to go curl up in the corner and and cry a little bit because I've been in that situation. <laughs> well, but that's like a really important thing when when considering our topic today, right? Enterprising up. So yes, are you capable of making this really comprehensive tool and spending your time on it? Sure. But you're also going to have to maintain that tool over time. And so, do you want to continue to spend time on this homegrown thing? Even are, are you, you're committing future you to also spend that time. Um, and I keep saying that because earlier this week, uh, Eric and I had a discussion about past us. And I was like, oh, that past Scott, he's such a jerk because he signed me up for something I didn't expect. Right. Future me was very unhappy with past me. Um, I, I think that was actually writing out the show notes for this episode. <laughs> what did we was. mean by that? We were like, what did we mean by this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, so I I think future Eric and future Scott are pretty cool guys, and we we want to set them up for success. Um, past us, maybe not so much. We forgot to actually define what the episode was, but so current us actually has, and this is like some Back to the Future weirdness now. <laughs> so future us has a lot of work to do. They have families. They have lives. They want to get back to their D and D campaign. Whatever the case may be, we. We love Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We're, we are kind of paid to say that, but it's true. Um, so there's things built into the operating system, like these Ansible-based system roles that can really help scale this out, whether we're talking an, a small environment of 20 servers, or if you're talking like a multi-billion dollar corporation that literally has tens of thousands of nodes that span physical, virtual, cloud, edge, all the things, all the places... And you don't want to have to, there, there's no possible way to go in and manage each of these systems by, by hand. So there's actually some tools built into the subscription that we can use. And I think I need to share your screen. Yeah, so uh, this is a tool that is included with every Red Hat Enterprise Linux subscription. In fact, if you're using the developer for individual subscription, you also have access to this for your Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. Um, this is a tool called Insights. And specifically, what I wanted to show you was the vulnerability um, tool within this, this portal. So essentially, like you register your system. <laughs> It collects data periodically and uploads it to Red Hat. And Red Hat will chew through that data, make some changes in the UI here to reflect the state of your system, and then they remove the data that they collected from your machine, right? So like the artifacts that it sets in the UI is how we keep track of things over time. Um, and a lot of things, or a lot of people will look at uh, Insights and they recall a tool called Advisor. That is also in here, but I think vulnerability is one of the most useful tools that it offers because it provides value to the system administrator immediately, right? So you can see it here on the overview page where um, I'm told, here's the population makeup of the vulnerabilities, the CVEs that are unmitigated across my registered system population, All right? So imagine if you're doing this yourself, what you, would you SSH to all the boxes? And then like look at the RPMs that are installed on them, or maybe use the security plugin for DNF. But like then you have to do that across your entire population. Um, whereas here we're having the data automatically collected and uploaded, and then we uh, analyze it and provide this UI with a report. Beyond the report, we can actually go into like really detailed specifications on what CVEs are out there, going by the numbers. Uh, this known exploit uh, tag. Basically, if there is a known exploit for this vulnerability in the wild, we'll stick that tag on it, right? So that it's like super important for you to pay attention to. Um, and the categorization, like how important is it? Critical, important, moderate, or low. Um, the CVSS score, that's the score between zero and 10 that tells us how really important it is. 
So um, that's that's why they get the categorization they get. And then the systems that are vulnerable to this. So if I select one of these. Be like, before you click off of there, I wanted to point out that this this uh, inventory isn't just uh, isn't just read only. You can actually uh, you can actually manipulate some of the uh, some of the columns. There's the status column and the business risk columns, where you as a sysadmin can go in, look at the CVE, and apply your own statuses. So if there is a production system that takes credit card data and it's got a, a seven point eight or a nine point eight you can go in and mark that as, we need to fix this right now. But if you've got a box that sits over in a corner uh, that's used by your systems administrators, you might mark that as, as your business risk is really low because maybe it's, maybe it's pretty well cordoned off. You'll get to that when you can. So you can go in and not just look at the industry-level vulnerability scores, but you can actually go in and manipulate it and add your own scores on top of that. Yeah, and I was actually just having this conversation earlier today with someone. Um, the other place where it may be interesting is, sure, the software that contains the CVE may be installed on your systems, but it was part of that gold image, right? So maybe your systems aren't running the service. So the software is there, but it's not actually in use or vulnerable because it's not executing on the systems. Now, ultimately, should you probably update that in case it gets turned on or in case it gets used? Probably. But when you're doing that initial assessment, you could put in a note that's like, oh, this is not actually as bad for us because we're not using this, this software. And that would be under kind of the business risk field that you can put in. All right. So um, if you toggle open the CVE ID, it gives you a little bit more description and that link there that says view more information that goes to the Red Hat um, security product security portal. It gives you a ton more data about like, uh, what exactly the vulnerability is, how it might be exploited, why Red Hat rates it a certain way, et cetera. Um, but what I want to show you is that I selected it. Um, actually, let me click it. And what I can do is I can select all of my affected hosts and notice that this remediate button comes up. Um, that's because I use a extra pay for subscription called Smart Management. Um, so that allows me to like click a button and it makes a playbook. And then the next time these systems call into insights, they will actually get this um, update applied to them, right? So you can schedule the playbook, the Ansible-based playbook to run. You can actually define what's in there. So things like reboots or not to reboots, or if there's additional shell scripty things that you need to do, you can put that in your playbook as well. Um, but this is a very easy way that you can attach to all of these boxes and fix their problem. Could you do it by hand? Sure. You can write a for loop with SSH and you can do a DNF update on whatever RPMs are required to manage this and then put in all the shell scripty stuff to reboot the machine or restart the service or whatever it is. Um, but when you're dealing with thousands of systems or complex systems, this is an alternative way of managing this update. Yeah, but that's only after you've gone through the hundreds of some odd servers to uh, open up a spreadsheet and copy and paste the 30 host names of affected systems after you've gone through your hundreds of systems to do an RPM-QA. Yes, that package is installed. No, the service is not running. And that took you all of like six hours. And then it took you another hour to fix it by writing a for loop. It's all right here in the console. And if you have access to RHEL at all, whether that's a developer subscription for individuals or whether that's a, a, a data center subscription, whatever the case may be, all this is included. All you have to do is install the insights package and ta-da, you get all this stuff right here. Future you will thank you. Yeah, or one that I used to get actually with, with some of my hobby stuff, I still get, um, you know, there will be a CVE that's announced and the first thing that's asked is like, are we susceptible to this? Right? So you have to go through and do like an audit across your population and then decide whether you are or not. And if you are, how bad is it? Um, and here, like, get you a lot of the way there. So you're not actually connecting to all the boxes to gather their data to figure it out. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of cool is under the report section, um, you can create a report. Oh, yes. These are awesome. <clears throat> yeah. And um, I'm going to have to share. Actually, no. Nope. Let me share one more tab. 
Sure. Well, you're well, you're switching. I'll, I'll kind of vamp on that. But uh, I, I mentioned opening a spreadsheet and dumping in host names and IP addresses and vulnerability statuses and all that kind of thing. Imagine if you didn't have to do that, because guess what? Insights de designs and uh, and formats and makes makes that report for you, so you can go in and see exactly what's going on. Uh, so if you, if you're a CIO or or an operations uh, manager or something, you I, I would get those requests a lot of, are we vulnerable? Can we prove it? Uh, and, and can you provide me the documentation? Because they've got to go to, to the business and say, we're fine, or we've got a, a maintenance window scheduled. But now you don't have to do that because you can take that, you can take that information and insights will uh, generate a very nice looking PDF that you can then just attach to an email and go, here, here's the systems. We've got a maintenance window scheduled. Everything's fine. Yeah, and so here's an example of what uh, a full detailed report looks like. You can customize the report to just say, show me, you know, include critical vulnerabilities or include critical and importance. Um, but this is the CVE number plus all of the affected hosts, right? Similar to what you saw on the dashboard. So if your information security team is like, hey, are we vulnerable? Show me. You can be like, here's a report. There you go. Um, and there's also a, an executive level report too, for those pointy haired bosses that are like, I like graphs, show me visually. Um, you can, you can send them the executive report rather than this kind of more spreadsheet report. All right. I see we have a couple of questions. Um, so let's, Shantanu brought up a good question here about insights. So Shantanu asks, uh, I guess insights is a rel only thing and a web portal. I mean, anything equivalent of, uh, of a CentOS fleet of servers? Uh, no. So, um, you know, this is one of the things that Red Hat provides as part of rel and it's offered as a service as part of your rel subscription. So if you're using a downstream clone of rel, it would be up to the downstream clone provider to build out a service that is like this. Um, and this is one of the reasons why like Red Hat literally has thousands of engineers and the downstream clones have like 20. So what are, are they going to be able to provide this level of detail and expertise? Well, and that's one of the reasons why we, we refer to being a part of Red Hat as a partnership because we, we have those hundreds and hundreds of engineers. We've got, um, We've got 20 some odd years of support cases of uh, knowledge base articles where we're able to compile all the experiences of all the sysadmins, all the support teams, everyone that's ever been. I'm not really overselling that and basically compile it into a database that that comprises insights. So. Uh, when we have vulnerability remediations, when we have advisor notifications, things that, hey, you might want to tweak this, you'll get better performance. That's built on years and years and years of data. So that's not something that a downstream can really take advantage of because they don't have that repository of, of data that, uh, that Red Hat's been able to collect over the years. And I see Shantanu ask a couple of other questions too, like uh, when I made my change to NTP, how does that affect the apps that are running? Um, well, hopefully... It, it wouldn't affect them that much because my time settings on all those systems were relatively reasonable. Um, but Steve Cassidy also pointed out like, hey, you probably need to do a validation to make sure that this is the case, right? So uh, maybe before you run your change, you just go out there and have a playbook that checks the time on all the machines and then can highlight which ones are r radically out of scope, right? You were probably already experiencing problems if your time was already messed up because things like secure socket layer requires a f within five minutes timestamp um, for client and servers to actually establish an SSL based connection. So um, yeah, but that's why I went through and like showed you the client one and client two crony C sources after I ran the playbook because that's the validation that what I did was actually effective, right? Um, and was applied to all the systems that I intended for it to be applied to. Uh, I'm kind of scrolling through here. Did you see any others you wanted to call out? Uh, I have, there's a lot there. I'm still reading the scroll back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
But don't worry, we've actually uh, we've we've got a uh, a colleague of ours, Rick, who's out in the chat, and he's kind of been uh, doing a great job of of answering questions. He is he uh, volunteered himself last after last episode uh, to be our Q and A wrangler. Um, so may may whatever deity you follow have mercy on your soul, because <laughs> as you can see, sometimes the chat gets kind of crazy. We are at the bottom of the hour, um, and we didn't get through even half of what we'd compiled for today's episode, so I feel like we should go and tell our past selves that it's okay. We'd, we had plenty of content. We'd, we ran out of time before we ran out of topics. Uh, so in a future episode, at some point, we'll, we'll kind of circle back to this topic, uh, because something I wanted to talk about was maintenance windows, patch cycles. Um, so today we kind of talked about you have an issue or you have a configuration change. How do you deploy that out to your enterprise? Uh, but in a future episode, we'll kind of follow up on this and talk about how do you how do you go about planning out those those types of um, those type of activities. Scott, you had something to to add? Yeah, I also wanted to mention that uh, we're going to be kicking off a new story arc uh, after a short break. So next week there will not be will not be a show because we have a, a Red Hat day off um, on Friday. But after that, we're going to kick off a new story arc focused on security. Yeah, definitely tell all your friends. Security is a hot topic, uh, both here and everywhere else. So tell a friend. Uh, we'll be talking about how to make your RHEL systems uh, a little bit more secure. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely talk about not disabling SE Linux. Stop it. Um, so a couple of changes to the show. Uh, notice that we have over here QR codes. Um, uh, so thank you to Restream, our, our, uh, our streaming platform for YouTube. Uh, another thing to mention is our uh, Twitch channel has been retired. Uh, we usually only got spam views from, from Twitch, so we've, we've retired that account. So definitely share out the, uh, the YouTube links for all of our content. Uh, and then also notice uh, in, in the QR code, we've got a updated Discord server. Uh, so the Red Hat live streaming Discord is kind of... Uh, fallen away. So we've partnered with the Enable Sysadmin community. Uh, if you've searched for how to do certain tasks on Linux, uh, there is probably an Enable Sysadmin article out there. It is an amazing community of systems administrators, some engineers, uh, some, some of the engineers that work on RHEL or some of the upstreams. Uh, so it's a great community. It's a growing community. So grab, grab that QR code right there and, uh, and, and be sure to tell a friend. <coughs> And speaking of telling a friend, be sure to like and subscribe to our content. Uh, really appreciate you all joining us today. Um, we know uh, by, uh, by, by liking this content, we can have a good idea of what to talk a little bit more about uh, and no to know what resonates with you. Be sure to subscribe, hit the bell so you can make sure to get uh, notified anytime we go live. And join us. Uh, we already talked about that. Um, that's what I get for trying to go on script after being off script. Um, uh, also, we will be having RHEL Presents next Wednesday. We'll be talking about RHEL at the Edge. We'll uh, answer questions like, what is the Edge? Who is Ben Briard? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, RPM OS tree. So if you're interested in Edge or if you've heard the the, uh, the term thrown around quite a bit, it is kind of a, it's, it's another hot topic out there. So join, uh, join uh, Brian Smith, Ben Briard, and myself next week for uh, RHEL Presents. Until then, uh, Scott, any closing thoughts? Uh, only that Ben Briard is fantastic and uh, good score on having him on as your guest on Roll Presents. I, I had to corner him at reInvent and tell him that he was going to join us. <laughs> and by corner him, you mean tackle him and sit on him until he promised <laughs> to come on? Because that's what I envisioned happened there. To be honest, I just asked. He was like, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. I'll come hang out. <laughs> so until... Uh... <laughs> Until next Wednesday, uh, on behalf of Scott McBrien and the entire Red Hat Enterprise Linux team, thank you so much for joining us live. And if you're catching this after the fact, be sure to comment. Uh, we, we check those comments pretty much on a daily basis. So have a great weekend, and we will see you next week on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux YouTube channel.